Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the different types of solids. A quick reminder, there are three types of chemical bonds that we have discussed. Metallic bonds, ionic bonds, and covalent bonds. Metallic bonds generally exist between two metal atoms where there is very little electronegativity, but very similar electronegativity. And so the electrons are generally very free to roam about the structure. In ionic bonds, a cation and anion are attracted to each other. These cation and anion were formed by the transfer of electrons. In a covalent bond, which is generally between two nonmetals, electrons are very tightly shared between two or more nuclei. There are also three different intermolecular forces that we have discovered. London dispersion forces, also occasionally referred to as van der Waal forces, dipole-dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonding. London dispersion forces are found in all molecules and atoms and even some ions, although they're usually not important for ions. They are due to a temporary shift in where electrons are located due to the random nature by which electrons move, therefore temporarily creating a dipole, an area that appears partially negative and one that appears partially positive. Dipole-dipole interactions are found in polar molecules where there is a permanent charge separation. The, the, this force works by having the positive end of one molecule attract the negative end of a neighbor. Hydrogen bonding is a unique kind of dipole-dipole interaction that occurs in molecules where there is a hydrogen atom that is bound to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, three very small, very electronegative elements. This creates unusually strong charge separation, and because the atoms are very small, it can act over much smaller distances as well. Bonds and intermolecular forces are both examples of Coulombic attraction at work, that attractive force that occurs between charged particles. Bonds are generally considered to be much stronger because they act over much smaller distances and sometimes with much larger charges involved as well. The properties of a compound are connected to which forces are present when they are in their solid or liquid state. Are they held together by a bond or an IMF? What kind of bond holds them together? What kind of IMFs hold them together? This has resulted in four broad categories of solids that we will now cover. First of these categories will be the metallic solids. These generally contain metal atoms, although occasionally you might find a different atom subbed into the structure, but still majority metal. They will be held together by metallic bonds, which involves that delocalized sharing of electrons electrons that are free to move throughout the structure and owned by all of the atoms within it. This results in a crystalline structure where electrons are very free to move. However, it's quite difficult to see the crystalline structure due to what metals generally look like to the human eye. Metals are also able to conduct electricity both in their solid and liquid states. In order to conduct electricity, you need to be able to allow electrons to flow readily. Since the electrons are delocalized and are already fr naturally freely moving, this means that allowing electrons to flow in a pattern to conduct electricity through them is very easy to accomplish, both for the solid and liquid state. Metals will not dissolve in water. They don't have similar forces to water, which is a molecular solid which we'll discuss later. This lack of similar forces means that they won't generally interact to form a solution together. Metals usually have high melting points and therefore even higher boiling points. There are a couple of ex ex exceptions to this rule, such as mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature, and gallium, which has an unusually low melting point that is very close to your own body temperature. Metals are also, very importantly, malleable and ductile. Because of their free-moving electrons, they can be bent in shape without breaking much more readily than the majority of the other types of solids. Our next category we'll discuss are ionic solids. Ionic solids contain cations and anions, most often in the form of a metal and a nonmetal in their ion forms, although there can also be polyatomic ions involved. These are held together by ion-ion interactions, where each anion is attracted to all of its neighbor cations and vice versa. Another way to consider this is that ionic bonds hold together the structure. Therefore, there is a strong bond that holds together the structure. Ionic solids have very crystalline structures. An example of a crystalline structure that they could take is shown on this slide. You'll notice an alternating pattern of cations and anions that is needed in order to keep this structure in place because two cations don't want to be near each other. 
So generally, two cations will be separated by an anion, and vice versa with anions and not wanting to be near each other. Ion, ionic solids will only conduct electricity if they are in their liquid state or dissolved. They cannot conduct as a solid. You'll notice this crystalline structure appears to be very, very rigid. Therefore, free moving charges, in this case the form ions, are not possible in the solid ionic structure. However, in the liquid state or in the aqueous state when dissolved in water, these ions are more free to move and therefore there can be freely moving charged particles in those states. Most ionic solids are water soluble. The ones that aren't generally have very strong ion-ion interactions that are not broken by forming new interactions by water. Ionic solids usually have very high melting and boiling points due to the ionic bonds that hold them together being relatively strong. There will of course be exceptions to this, but generally speaking, they are unusually high. Molecular solids are those that are formed when molecules interact with each other. They are held together by the intermolecular forces, which one depends on the molecule that makes up the solid. Molecular solids can take a lot of different kinds of structures. Some are crystalline, like sugar, and others are more amorphous without a recognizable repeating pattern, such as something like candle wax. Our amorphous molecular solids often end up being malleable to a certain extent, where they can be bent and changed shape and molded in your hand. Not often to the same extent that metals are, but similar. Molecular solids will not conduct electricity no matter what state they are in. They act as insulators, something that prevents the flow of heat or electricity. For example, rubber is a molecular solid and rubber is known as an insulator. This is because the atoms and are arranged in their molecules and the molecules are arranged near each other in such a way that there is no freedom of movement for charge. The solubility of molecular solids varies drastically in water. Water is a molecular solid. Polar molecules that are like water will be able to dissolve in water. So for example, something like ethanol or sugar is polar and therefore it can dissolve in water. Nonpolar molecules, however, will not be able to dissolve in water. Nonpolar molecules will only have London dispersion forces, whereas the very polar water has dipole-dipole interactions and also hydrogen bonding. This lack of similar interactions means that nonpolar cannot dissolve in water. However, nonpolar molecules might be able to dissolve in a nonpolar solvent, such as hexane, which is a nonpolar six carbon chain. Molecular solids have much lower melting and boiling points compared to all three of the other categories of solids. Some of these will be so low that they won't be solids at room temperature. For example, nitrogen counts as a molecular solid. However, nitrogen, N2, is a gas at room temperature. The fourth and final category we will discuss is the covalent network solid. As the name implies, this solid is held together by a network of covalent bonds and therefore takes on a highly crystalline structure. This generally will occur between nonmetal atoms, although you will notice that there are some metalloids, such as silicon, that show up here as well. The conductivity of covalent network solids varies. The vast majority of them will act as insulators. However, there are a couple of notable exceptions to this and the ones that are conductors. Generally, they're not going to be excellent conductors, but they are technically conductors. That would be graphite, which is a form of carbon where the carbon is arranged in sheets that are parallel to each other. There is some space for movement of electrons between the parallel layers and that allows it to be conductive. Silicon is a metalloid, and therefore it starts to take on some metallic characteristics despite its bonds being categorized as covalent bonds for the most part. Covalent network solids are very insoluble in water and most other solvents. Generally, most covalent networks will only have one solvent they can dissolve in, and it will be something that is very, very similar to it in structure and will be unique to the covalent network solid. Covalent network solids also have exceptionally high melting and boiling points, much, much higher than you would see for a metal or an ionic compound usually. For example, the sublimation point for diamond is in the 3000 degrees Celsius, whereas melting points for most metallic and ionic compounds will be in the upper hundreds or around 1000. From the description of a solid, you should be able to identify what kind of solid it is. 
So let's look at an example. A white crystalline solid does not conduct electricity in its solid state, nor when it is dissolved in water. It has a fairly low melting point. What kind of solid is this unknown material? We should first consider what properties we have been presented. We were told about the conductivity for this unknown solid in multiple states. We were told it will not conduct electricity as a solid, nor when it's in an aqueous state. We learned about its solubility in water because it mentioned that it could be dissolved in water in order to test if it was conductive there, which it wasn't. We also know that its melting point is fairly low. So between all of these, we should be able to take a guess as to which of the four categories this belongs to. The answer is that this example will be a molecular solid, but we should consider what evidence are we citing in order to determine that it is molecular solid. The first piece of evidence that I would likely cite here is the low melting point. That's something unique to molecular solids. Other important things to keep in mind is the idea that it was never conductive in any state, which is very common for molecular solids as well, although that is also common for several of the covalent networks. However, unlike a covalent network, it was able to dissolve in water. 